Hello, my name is Gordy Holt, and this is Community Talk. Each of us has stories, stories that, that help us to understand and to explain our world. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people, people who have had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who have had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories that help us to better understand our world. And they help us to connect with each other. And Community Connections is about those people and about their stories. And I'm sure that you will enjoy meeting these amazing, amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Enjoy. Welcome to Community Connections. My name is Gordy Hogue. And today's guest is a remarkable young man, well, not totally young anymore, who has contributed significantly to, to our community and indeed to our country. He has supported many nonprofit social service agencies, and he has worked at international institutions in support of social and ethnic equality. And he represented Canada in both the 1968 and 72 Olympics. I am delighted to welcome Ken Sully, welcome to Community Connections, Ken. Thank you, Gordy. Oh, can you talk a little bit about uh, being born in New Westminster, but coming, but living in White Rock your whole, well, for the majority of your life by a long shot, and what, what that was like and what you learned through that? Well, I was born in 1950 in New West because uh, White Rock's hospital wasn't built till 1954, as you know. And uh, I have tremendously fond memories about growing up in White Rock. It was so different then, you know, I mean, we lived on two and a half acres and our neighbors, the Arnolds lived on two and a half acres right in, on Bunibest Avenue in the middle of White Rock. And it would walk up to school every day past where you and your parents lived and, you know, with a big 10 or 12 acre field there. So I, I think I, I, when I reflect back on all that, just how quickly you know things have changed and i was i was thinking back and i remember the four-way stop at 16th and uh johnson road and uh when you went north of there the old fire hall and you'd see some deer across the road and <laughs> and when they built the what's now Samamu high school but was white rock junior high school for us it just seemed to be way out in the middle of nowhere with all the uh the, where the, mall, the Hilltop Mall is now there. So, uh, yeah, just a, the change has happened. I was, you know, I think about, you know, on the, there's always Midway Motors and then the Players Club. And I remember going to my first Christmas pantomime down on the waterfront before the theater was built there. And just, that was just so much a part of uh, living in White Rock. And, and Ray Woodward had the gas station on the corner of uh, Johnson Road and 16th. And then, he redeveloped into a beautiful mall with the Royal Bank and many tenants. And now that's been taken down and the high rise is going up. And who could ever have dreamed that the rapid growth and changes, you know, I, I think back, you know, growing up, we didn't have an ice rink. Everyone used to go to Delta to play hockey. We didn't have a swimming pool. And now we have all these wonderful facilities and softball, BC and and I have lots of really uh, fond memories of being actively involved with the White Rock Swim Club every summer and the hillside, which now has all these amazingly beautiful um, view homes, modern view homes built on 33 foot lots where, you know, it was all the old summer houses and people coming from New West and Vancouver for the summer. And, and so I have lots of, you know, being down on the beach and you know, walking along on the rocks on the railway tracks and getting, uh, when they had the dolphins on the pier, getting fish and chips there, just, uh, and uh, yeah, so there, it was, it was, it was a, just a, a different lifestyle, a different pace of life. And, uh, um, you know, we used to, we used to always go down to Montgomery's fish and chips and then he'd wrap it up in newspaper and always put a couple chips on the top for the kids. So we were always excited about uh, going down there. So, and, and, and you know, and, and so I'm third generation um, involved in real estate and land development. So my grandfather who, uh, was involved in Vancouver, built 150 houses, uh, carried a lot of financing, and then he went broke in the, in the 30s and they, they moved out uh, 
to 8th Avenue and 200th in a very, very uh, modest, uh, small single family home. And then over the years, him and my dad ended up, you know, having five real estate offices, which were under LK Sully. My dad always ran the one in White Rock, but there was one in Cloverdale, one in Wally, or Newton, I should say, and there was one up in Alder Grove. And, um, and, and, and they used to do, um, they, they sold real estate and they sold insurance. And one of the things that I, I always found so interesting, you know, my dad was talking about it is, you know, when we talk about CMHC and insured mortgages or the government placing high ratio financing, that there was a period of time there when NHA, National Housing Act, where they wouldn't provide any financing south of the Fraser River. I mean, you know, it's, it seems so funny when you think about it now. And so my dad and my grandfather had a fairly substantial business. Um, they'd, they'd be back then we used to get a lot of people selling their farms on the prairies and retiring in White Rock. And then they would, they would put the money out for them into mortgages for people in houses and guarantee the, 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 the repayment of them. And so it seems funny to think that the government wouldn't put a mortgage out to the Fraser River. <laughs> sure does, yeah. <laughs> when we see everything that is that is there so um but yeah just you know and, and i think uh you know the thing that that always amazes me because i think we all find change hard but every change that has come it's we've lost a little something but it's still it has tremendous appeal and i i've said to you before gordy i think one of the biggest changes in white rock over the years you know was the beautification of our beach and the walkway along the beach and just how tremendous that has been you know and and um and opening up of our parkways and things i think there's been some real tremendous shifts and and i think right now we're seeing even bigger shifts and you know there that seems to go through periods where people are hesitant to growth and then there's some spurts of growth and uh, we're, we're seeing the town center develop in a way that I hadn't envisioned it happening so quickly. So but yeah, those are just some of my first kind of ramblings on about growing up in White Rock. Yeah. And what about uh, going to elementary school and how did you actually get involved in, in sport and in diving? Because there weren't a lot of resources around at that time. And uh, I know you had a, a pool at your house eventually, but uh, how did you get involved in diving and what was brought you onto that? Well, I mean, really, it's, it's, it was a combination of getting involved with the White Rock Amateur Swim Club out at the end of the pier. And then uh, I think when I was about six or seven, my dad put a pool in and Wendell Arnold, my neighbor, and I both liked diving. And, uh, and then because we enjoyed that, um, Carol Ann Morrow uh, was a, dove in the 64 Olympics and her mom, Noel Morrow, who swam in the Olympics, lived in Ocean Park and we started to take some diving lessons. And then at one sea festival event, Irene McDonald, who represented Canada in Melbourne Olympics and got a bronze medal, uh, came out and I met Irene and it was right around then that they built the Dees Island Tunnel, which means you could get from White Rock to Vancouver. <laughs> and we used to drive that a lot, five, six times a week. Um, when there wasn't a lot of traffic. And, and so it was through that that I met Irene and, and then um, got really more serious about competing uh, with diving and, and was fortunate enough to represent Canada on a number of different teams and trips. So, And you won a silver medal at the Commonwealth Games, I recall. I did in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Yes, Edinburgh. I did, yeah. And it's uh, in, in, in business, uh, Rick Friesen, who's my partner, his brother was also yeah. all of the, there's a lot of history within White Rock that goes back to diving. Frank Groff and I started selling real estate under LK Sully Realty, and then with Ralph and Denise Stevenson and Rick Nessamy formed Bay Realty, but Frank's an old diver, and his wife and I used to dive together, and they have boys who was Canada's athlete of the year there and came fourth in the Mexico Olympics lives in Ocean Park. So there were all these kind of kind of sport connections which came out and settled in the White Rock area, which was great, so. Are there some things from uh, the discipline that's associated with, with sport and having to have that kind of structure and discipline? How does that uh, relate to, or contribute to going into to business and later in life and having that kind of 
background and history and foundation. Does that in some way impact or affect how you uh, continue on in life? Well, I think it certainly has to have an influence. I think, you know, you become goal oriented, you know, you're hoping to make the Commonwealth Games team or the Pan American Games and your training and your, you know, so, so I think you just learn a good work ethic and, um, you know, and I think yeah, yeah, there's a bit of, uh, you know, I think success breeds success. So I think if you've done well at something that, that has a tendency to carry over thinking maybe I can do okay over here too. And, um, yeah, so, you know, and I think also, you know, through sport that we all learn disappointment <laughs> yeah. and, and, and uh, failure and then getting back up and giving it another go. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's lots of life lessons to be learned through competitive sport. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, made some wonderful lifelong friendships. And, and, you know, I got to see some parts of the world. I mean, we... we um, we went into East Germany, you know, crossed at Checkpoint Charlie. And, um, and then after I finished competing in Munich, we were asked to go on a cultural exchange to China, swimming and diving trip. And this is back when everyone still wore Mao jackets and, and Tiananmen Square, everybody was riding bicycles, tens of thousands of them. And so we've had some really wonderful um, opportunities to see different parts of the world and, and meet people and see different cultures. So, you know, and then we got involved in, in um, selling real estate. And then over time, we got involved in doing some developing of real estate. And, um, you know, and I think we're very fortunate. You know, I just happened to be born here. I didn't choose to do business in White Rock. But I, there really wasn't a better place in Canada to be in our business. And um, so we were very fortunate in the, in the 80s um, to, to do late 70s into the 80s to do quite a little bit of land development. And, and, you know, we've always tried to give back a bit in the community and sat on the hospital board and did some fundraising for the arts community. And, you know, and now, uh, you know, we, we, we try to support sources and the food bank and some of the good stuff that they do. And, I think it's one of the really nice things about South Surrey is there's, it's a small community and there's a lot of really good people trying to make this a better place. And, and that I've always found really um, inspiring. So, what was, what was life at uh, Simon Fraser University? You were one of the, when Simon Fraser opened and uh, you were one of the students there and, and dove there. What, what was that experience like? And moving from White Rock to, into dorms, uh, up at Simon Fraser and that whole experience of getting away from the community and involved in a whole other community. Well, I, I think SFU opened in about 1966, I think, in that range. 67, I think. Yeah. And so Irene McDonald, who I mentioned before with my diving coach, became the diving coach of Simon Fraser. So I was training there for uh, several years before um, finally go well, for a couple of years, we finally going there. Maybe it was 65, was it? Yeah. I think it was 66, 65, 66. Yeah, because I, I, I dove there for a couple of years and, and I graduated from high school in 68 and and was really fortunate to make the 68 Olympics when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I started in that, that spring. But I think the thing that was good, you know, for me there is just, you know, that the, the whole athletic department and, and meeting people on the basketball team and on the football team and on the track and field team and you know and all these athletes had their own goals and hopes and and um so you know once again it was just uh back then i mean you know i mean i mean amateur athletics was really amateur i mean <laughs> someone, someone someone couldn't give you a bathing suit or you were you, you, you were you were off the team eh and um uh, and so most most people or a lot of people then you know went to college and then when they finished college they retired and, you know and now because of the the financial incentives uh, lots of uh, successful athletes continue on for quite a, a long time and um, you know another sign of how the world has changed i mean this trip that i mentioned earlier about going to china um, what they did is they phoned all the athletes that retired after the Munich Olympics. 
And the reason they did that is back in 1974, China did not belong to FINA, which was the International Swimming Federation. And so we were banned from competing in the 76 Olympics. So we knew that going, but we had all retired. It was just a, a wonderful um, type of trip. But it just shows how the world's changed, you know. And, and I think in that regard, in a good way, you know, there's lots of other issues around the Olympic movement under discussion right now. But, but it certainly opened the world up uh, in, in lots of, I think, positive ways as well. So. And how, how significant in terms of the, the growing up in sport and having the, the support of your parents? Uh, to do that. And in, in those days, and I'm assuming your parents were instrumental in getting you to places and providing financial support and commitments that they would make and sacrifices that they, they would make to ensure that uh, you were successful. Absolutely. You know, my dad loved sport. He <laughs> sure did. Yeah. He, he played on the UBC uh, Dominion Champion basketball team. And he, as you know, he was involved when we had a senior men's uh, basketball league going, but yeah, without my parents' support, that would never, I mean, you know, I started winter diving when I was 13, so my my mom was so glad when I turned 16 and could <laughs> for myself. Yeah. But, you know, my parents got really involved, and it was at a time like when, just when I was kind of going through sport, sport was changing, you know, Irene worked as a bank teller and coached off hours and then the professional coaches started coming along which is what's more prevalent now but you know my parents got really involved at the and it was at the time when they the canadian amateur diving association was founded and and so they were very instrumental my dad was president of the canadian amateur diving association and they were very involved in all of that for quite a few years so i had tremendous support from my parents so and, and you remember you referenced the White Rock Amateur Swim Association, which I'm, I think I attended their hundredth, is their hundredth anniversary, about a couple of years ago. And so yeah. that, I think they're the oldest amateur swim association in BC. And I think then your father was certainly instrumental in getting the Sosuri pool as well. So contributing in that fashion. So. Yeah, very much so. Rod Kerr, there was a group of them. And I, I think uh, Noel Morrow as well. So yeah. And so in, in terms of the, the kind of support that your parents provided you, is, was that uh, in any way modeling for you with, with your children in terms of the things that they were doing and how you could support them? Or do you think that was a natural evolution to the kind of support you've provided to your children over the years as well? Well, I think we've certainly tried to support them in, in their areas of interest. I mean, it's kind of interesting that, that both their parents competed in the Olympics, yeah. <laughs> but, but none of them really got overly involved in any um, particular sport. Um, I think they've, they've more uh, excelled in the area of um, academics and um, really involved with something in Children's International, Summer Villages, and with United World Colleges, so a much more uh, global um, academic view of it. And, and of course, and then Sun Lee uh, is the fourth generation um, uh, land developer and uh, sits on Source's board uh, and, and is very involved. He's the one that got our company to be the lead sponsor on Coldest Night of the Year now for the, the last three years. So, so um, and he hit the last, we built a couple of uh, office buildings and he built the last one without any help from <laughs> any of us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so none of them have went down except, you know, like, like we, we, uh, we love skiing as a family. And, um, you know, I'm, right now my, my three year old grandson went on the magic chair yesterday and his older brother had a lesson today, but we're not able to be with them at Whistler. We have a place up there for, we have for five weeks of the year because of COVID and we're not in their bubble right now. So, so we miss that part of it, but uh, there's something um, wonderful when you can all go and ski at your own level and your own place and you come back after and, and uh, have a meal together. It's uh, very special. And when you reference uh, your children and the activities they have internationally, uh, 
in terms of that type of work. That opportunity didn't seem to exist when we were growing up uh, and you're sort of describing how different our community is, but our world is a dramatically different place as well. And the opportunities that, that your children have to, to go out and, and play in the international marketplace to make contributions all over the world is pretty significant. Yeah. And then the internet allows people to stay connected. You know, I mean, you know, we, we made lots of friends from all these other countries and you'd see them a couple times a year, but, but then it passed. And, and so now I, 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 I think it's really wonderful. Um, some of the technology that can allow people to, to stay connected. And, um, and, and I think, you know, I think the United World College, which is really, you know, um, you know, looking at issues around peace and justice. And those are things that, that, that have always, um, I felt very strongly about, and, and I know you have as well, Gordy. And um, yeah, so I, I think they were really given some wonderful opportunities. And, um, you know, the two of the kids got their doctoral degrees and uh, I, mean, I got my bachelor's, but then I was moving on, so. <laughs> Yeah, I got my bachelor's and moved on and somehow kept drifting back. Yeah. Getting along the way. But certainly the special one of the special things about growing up in White Rock is the sense of connection with people, you know. And and so I've lived in Vancouver for a few years now, but there's still that sense of connection and the people that you grew up. Like when we went to high school, you knew everybody. You know, there wasn't, you know, and everybody was friends. You know, it was it was a uh, it was a, a really kind of unique time in White Rock. And, and um, yeah, I should have said when I was born at, at the Royal Columbia Hospital, it was your dad who delivered me. <laughs> yeah. I can remember lying at home on our Chesterfield watching TV, being sick, and Doc Hove would come and do a house call. I mean, <laughs> but there's okay. something really um, uh, special about that too, eh? It's just, it's a, it was a different time. And, and it was a good time. Yeah. And you, d you described uh, how the community changed in the summer where so many people from other parts of the lower mainland came out in the summer. And I remember thinking that, gee, all winter, you know everybody on the street, but in the summer, you see somebody that you don't recognize, say, hi, where are you from? And it was sort of that, that sort of connection that happened. And we lived at the beach during the summer and as we were growing up. We lived at the pier and on the waterfront and, and we're gone, all, gone in the morning and back late at night. And had a wonderful time down at the Dolphins and the pier. And, and it was a great social network. We got to know everybody. And that social see connected. Sea social Festival connected. Parade. Yeah, Sea <laughs> Festival Parades. And a, oh, that stuff is all great. And I can remember when we were in high school in the summer, you know, we'd be down. We just loved playing beach volleyball. Like, like I go along all the beaches now and they have all these wonderful nets. I mean, we used to have driftwood with some old <laughs> nets. And I think, oh man, I would love to have been playing beach volleyball like it is now, but it was good then too. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Brown, I think he had his, what he had a square dancing club that was out there and he taught all kinds of things. And so we were just, and that was at the Dolphins as well. And through the winter so yeah there was something for us to be doing all the time it seemed and as you mentioned the players club was down in the waterfront across from Sammy Amla Park and uh, then we had uh, the the little theater oh, the little theater and then we had uh, on the movie play at the park theater oh the park theater then that was the wildest movie theater <laughs> you would ever go to in terms of rowdiness <laughs> and Mr. And the the A and W. That's where you went on Friday and Saturday night. Was Everybody just, showed up at the A and W yeah. next door, right? Yeah, and Mr. Petrovich at the, the Park Theater with a flashlight coming down and making sure we were all being well behaved and not throwing too much stuff at the screen. That was, and everybody was there, as you say. It was a, everybody knew, it was the place to meet the social center before we had community centers. And every the whole community seemed to be a center rather than the, the models that come into today. I always laugh because I tell people, you know, when I was growing up, Crescent Beach was a long ways away. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, like it was another whole community of people. <laughs> yeah, like Ocean Park. I remember when I was playing Little League and Vin Coyne was my coach and we were told there were some people coming from Ocean Park and we were like, 
where's that? And it was yeah. Derwin Dunbar and the Boucher boys that arrived and from some place called Ocean Park. It was like another world, it seemed to us in those days. Yeah, and I remember growing up, there was kind of, you know, where we lived down at Buena Vista, there were the Pattersons and the McPherson and the Heises, and then we'd play roller hockey and we'd go up and there was the trails and the Cliffords and that and Ted the Hates and, and then we and then there was the Hots and the Kendrins. There was all these different neighborhoods with people that all knew each other and would get together and do different things. So yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty special time to grow up in this community and hopefully there's a different sense of that that is still in existence now, but still some of that that social connectedness, that social modeling that is so important to in the creation of community and the connections that come through that. I always, my dad always told me about my grandfather, that my grandfather always envisioned how the growth would happen exactly as it is right now, all the way out to Abbotsford, Solid, eh? And, um, you know, he, he always uh, was a bit of a gambler on land, and, and uh, <laughs> which turned out in the long run to be a really good thing. But, yeah. um, yeah, I was sorry that my grandfather died when I was about 17. So I never really got to know him you know, from the business side of things. But, you know, I certainly learned a lot from my father just with all his experience. Yeah. And he certainly helped me a lot, you know, when I was learning the business as well. So, so in terms of the, the people who have been your, your role models or sort of your heroes, you mentioned some in diving and, and some in your family in terms of the business, would, would you... Name some of those people that uh, you saw as kind of your role models, people who have inspired you in terms of both sport and, uh, and business? Well, I, I think that, um, well, I think going through high school, our common friend, Ed Carlin, was always a real motivator. And I think he really encouraged people to, to, to do their best and, and had a real sense of connected uh, connectedness, you know, with, with everybody. And, and I think through diving, I, I, I met just a lot of really good people uh, that, um, you know, Hobie Billingsley was a, an American coach and I found, you know, him very inspiring, um, you know, motivational wise. And um, yeah, I would, and I, I would sit and talk about, I got really involved with the Fraser Valley the real estate board and was a director there for a bunch of years, you know, and, and there were people there that have been around for a long time. Um, individual name it just the, the whole setting there was was really uh helpful and, and 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 you know when i got involved on the hospital board and I had a new respect for the medical community seeing how early they got there and the meetings they went to and back to the office after and 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 started to get a sense of all the really good people in our community that were giving back and helping out and raising money and one of the most inspiring things for me about White Rock has always been the ladies auxiliary, the hospital auxiliary. I mean, man, they would run the superfluity shop. And I mean, they went out and they were buying houses for 50,000 and they were buying them. And, you know, they created a land um, assembly for all our, our hospital needs. I mean, unbelievable, you know, I mean, it really, truly inspiring so and they're still doing that it's still amazing what yeah, they do today and they're they're talking about redevelopment again and with their they're so you go. i mean you know i you know i just see all the people you know like when when the hospital is expanding and and they they're raising money the generosity of the community and there's more a little bit involved here with the new hospice uh uh, facility and just you know the people really step up and and, and give back and, and that's where you know I think we're so lucky and there's a lot of really talented and gifted people that live in our community sure so you talked about your grandfather projecting where things were going to go if uh, if you were to take on your grandfather's lens and look at our community today where do you see it being 25 years or 50 years from now can you look off into the future and uh, just like your grandfather did and give us some sense of what you think might might be in the, in the future? Well, I, I mean, the one thing that, you know, I, I think I would say is that um, 
I think our biggest mistakes have not been um, fully understanding how our communities are going to grow. And we've always had 20 year plans and we've always had this, but you know, there's that resistance. Hey, some people that I have a great deal of respect for, you know, we're carrying signs, stop the Semianu shopping center, you know? And if there was anything wrong with the Semianu shopping center is it was way too small, you exactly. know? And we couldn't create that community. And, and I can remember a friend of mine did a project on thrift and that must have been on Vidal and you know it went from three stories and they wanted it on one side down to one story to tie in with the single family and you know now there's 20 stories on the other side of it I mean and and those aren't criticisms they're just you know you know I think like like the on the old Safeway site where there were four 10-story towers you know and that was really controversial and I think like once they're there, people realize that two 20 story towers would have been better. Like, I think we've, we've underestimated, like, I really believe in going up, but not going up just for the sake of density, going up to, to create usable space on the ground. So, so like, like in that case there, there's a park, a, um, a city park. But a park could have been twice as big if there were two towers, and now they end up being that. So, you know, I think it's going to continue to grow. I mean, um, you know, Vancouver has such unique challenges with the mountains and the oceans and the border and the agricultural land reserve that, that there's going to be. Um, but, you know, it's still one of the most desirable places in the world to live. It's, a, you know, we're quite a, an ethnically diverse uh greater Vancouver and and I think those trends will continue and and so I think you know I, I think they need to um, they just need to find ways to not be afraid I mean, I mean not be afraid to 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 go higher and create better ground oriented spaces you know I mean we need futurists in our planning department I mean I know Surrey got an award for including the public and I said well what you have is a community plan planned by the public, not by planners or futurists. And so, and, and it's well intended and, 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 and they're good people. And it's just not a personal criticism, but I, 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 I think our, 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 our window of vision is, is way too small. And, and I mean, I, I, I never saw South Surrey change. Um, I never envisioned it changing as quickly as it did. Particularly when you go across the highway, it was kind of you're getting out into sunny side. I mean, you know, growing up, growing away, they live way out there. I mean, you know, it's it's the center of things now. And 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 you know, I mean, I, I you know, despite all that, I I think it's a tremendous community, and and a lot a lot of things have been done well, and. Um, and it's going to continue to grow and, and it's going to continue to grow up because the land isn't there for it to grow any other way. So. And thank you so very much for being a guest on Community Connections and for all the wonderful contributions that uh, you've, you've made to this community, you and your family, and helping to make it the wonderful place that it is to live. And as you say, it's, I think, one of the best parts uh, of British Columbia, which is, British Columbia is one of the best parts of Canada and Canada perhaps the best place to live in the world. So we're pretty blessed and uh, you felt, uh, you and your family felt to make it that way. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts our comments that you may have, we're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful community. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.